Hello and welcome to Digital Futures. Today we're really excited to bring together one of the last session within the series of 3D printing in architecture, 3D printing fashion. Today we will be joined with uh, with speakers from who are who are currently located uh, in different places, and we are really delighted to have them uh, uh, join us and present their work. We will be joined with by Benas Farahi, uh, Jenny Wu, Jessica Rosenkurt, and um, uh, Natalie Alema. Nicola Casas uh, couldn't join us today, but we, we are happy to have him contribute in, in our upcoming sessions in the future. Uh, so before we begin, let me just quickly uh, give a quick uh, overview of how successful the last four weeks have been. Uh, we started with our sessions on 3D printing, crafting, conservation, and also some 3D printing sessions which happened um, in, uh, in Spanish uh, language as well. 3D printing, uh, crafting, conservation session brought together uh, voices from uh, from uh, HKU, Urban Reef, and also one of our uh, team members, Sara Kadarin, who actually presented uh, an interesting conversation and discussion around how 3D printing and specifically robotic 3D printing is uh, looking forward into the future of uh, building towards our ecosystem and really in retrospecting the the idea of local craft as well into the context of new technologies such as robotic printing. Uh, we also had sessions uh, in uh, in Spanish where we were looking at what are the things that are being done within the Spanish diaspora and how uh, we are looking at robotic 3D printing in in the context of even local uh, uh, regional uh, uh, craft as well. Uh, and also this weekend, we will be presenting the work from uh, some of the tutorials which happened uh, online. Again, these tutorials happened in Spanish and uh, the students both from Digital Futures tutorial session as well as uh, located in uh, Peru are building a pavilion uh, uh, from these tutorials that were that were conducted over a period of a weekend uh, this this month. Uh, last week, we had uh, Ronald Ryle uh, joining us to to kind of really have a have a uh, introspective uh, discussion on what it means to be doing three D printing in the context of more local materials. What are the questions that surround uh, the idea of making uh, with the community? So. Without further delay, uh, let's begin today's session. And I would like to invite uh, uh, Jenny Wu, uh, who is currently uh, joining us uh, at a very long hour of the of the day for her. Jenny, we're uh, we're really excited to have you. So, just a quick introduction: she is the founder and principal of LA-based architecture firm Oilo Wu uh, Collaborative. The firm is recognized for its innovative design that spans multiple scales, project types ranging from small scale urban uh, activations to large scale infrastructural project. Her office was the winner of multiple awards, including 2013 Design Vanguard Award, Acadia Digital Practice Excellence Award, uh, uh, J. Irvine and uh, Miller Price recipient, and also most uh, recently, they also won uh, the American Academy of Arts and Letters Award. Uh, Jenny, we are super thrilled to be hearing from you uh, and, and just going through your work as well today. So I'm just going to stop sharing and give it to Jenny. Okay, great. Thank you. One second. And... Can you see my screen? Yes, we good. Perfect. Give me one second. All right. So, hi everyone. Um, my name is Jenny Wu. I am a partner at Oila Wu Collaborative, and I'm also the founder of Lace. Um, it's a 3D printed jewelry brand. Um, I mean, but since today's topic is about um, fashion and objects. Um, 
I think mostly I, I'll, you know, uh, at my core, I'm an architect and I still practice. And so my path to LACE is through architecture. And um, both of uh, these two practices is something that I have been kind of balancing for the last 10 years. Um, so um, I think uh, just to start, I wanted to just click through a few uh, slides because I think at the core of um, who I am, um, I'm really a kind of designer and a maker. And so, so much of uh, the architecture that we do uh, in the very beginning were uh, things that we produce ourselves, um, a lot of installations that we both designed and fabricated. And I think through this process of, of making uh, your own work, I think there is an, a kind of appreciation for, for the detail and for how things come together, ideas of assembly. And, um, and as we grew, uh, you know, the office uh, been around for uh, since 20, 2000, Seven and so uh, the the project has gotten bigger, um, and we moved out of building the work uh, ourselves. But at the same time, um, I think the lessons learned from the earlier days um, it's still something that we practice. We still like to build things um, at a smaller scale, uh, even when we're working on bigger projects. So. Um, we, we make a lot of things outside of um, just architecture, but we uh, make a lot of these um, 3D printed uh, objects. Um, we call these uh, uh, 3D puzzles. And um, in each of these puzzles, we start to uh, think about how things are uh, put together and assembled. So all of these models um, have no glue in them and uh, you have to consider how they can come together uh, without, um, you know, just gluing it together. And so each one of them dis, uh, really start to think about and then a, a kind of attachment method, a connection method. So in the last one, it was kind of a rotate and click. And this one is a slide and click. <clears throat> and this next one is really uh, thinking about uh, um, simulating the kind of concealed joint to create uh, this puzzle. And I think the kind of the, the beauty of these 3D puzzles are the, the idea that um, as you start to deassemble them, um, they start to reveal something spatially that you might not have uh, known. And I think, you know, we like the idea that somehow architecture can be in this flux between being assembled and deassembled. So, um, so I think a lot of these interests from the, the kind of the earlier work of the architecture um, and also the objects that we make um, has led to, uh, to LACE, which is started as a kind of passion project for myself. Um, for the last 10 years, um, I was mainly designing sort of necklaces like these. Um, and so when I first started, um, it was really about kind of just, you know, I had this idea, I like to wear something that gave my neck a little bit of um, a pop. And, and so um, at that time, I didn't really know how to, um, you know, design jewelry, but I knew how to 3D print. So, and <clears throat> at I was also thinking about like, what can we do with 3D printing that you couldn't do traditionally? So for example, this piece is made of uh, um, a lot of uh, interlocking pieces, but obviously they're not there. This piece, this necklace is printed as entirely as one and not uh, in modules. And so I think um, thinking about the ways that uh, actually 3D printing has led to uh, simplifying production, um, 
sort of got me thinking about like what can we actually start a brand with 3D printing. So, and then, so uh, some of these necklaces were some of the first things that um, I designed. And then uh, we started working with uh, different materials, for instance, in um, direct 3D print, uh, in binder jetting, and now some of the higher end uh, machines that direct print in metals. Um, and I think that um, to me, um, you know, what has been one of the most kind of rewarding uh, part of um, being in this uh, industry, especially in 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 three D printing, uh, and just seeing the kind of uh, growth in um, you know the the maturity of the machines and the things that we were I wasn't able to do back in twenty fourteen and things that you could do now it's so uh, vastly different. Plus also the, just the cost of making these pieces have been so um, become more feasible. So I think there's just um, pretty exciting to be able to um, test uh, technologies um, to, and apply it to fashion. And so in, in a lot of our, um, our designs, uh, it really, has tapped into a lot of the, the inspiration from the architecture where we're looking at, you know, a lot of line work, things that start to bundle and twist and and combine and assemble in interesting ways. And um, we've also then uh, started to produce uh, things that are more um, in the precious metals, which um, we print in a wax and cast. And I think mean, think through this process, um, you realize I, I've always wanted to um, create a brand that was, um, you know, that could attract um, a range of um, different customers. And when you're in uh, this business long enough that you uh, realize some people are you know, really like the maximalist and there are, there's a, such a range. And I think it's been fun to think about um, kind of creating that range of something that's much more minimal to something that are statement pieces. And then um, we also started to um, work on, um, and with each step with, with Lace have been in some ways kind of uh, happy accidents. Um, you know, we went into the um, the wedding ring, engagement ring, uh, because someone said, oh, can you take this ring and put a diamond on it? And of course, you know, I hadn't, I didn't know anything about diamonds. And so uh, <clears throat> it's been such a, a fun, but, you know, challenging learning curve in, in, in figuring out how to do all this. Um, and then um, one of the things I um, started doing even more, and I think in the beginning, we were just trying to find materials that um, would uh, 3D print and then would also be kind of safe to wear. Um, and uh, I think especially sort of post pandemic, a lot of really interesting new technology have been um, kind of progressing, especially a lot of things, a lot of technology that were in R&D maybe through the pandemic became um, things that we were able to uh, play with. So um, we've done a lot of interesting uh, collaborations with uh 3D printing companies. Uh, for example, this one, um, we worked with um, a, car, a company called uh, Impossible Objects and they work with carbon fiber. Um, so we worked on, and they're, um, what's so interesting about the, te um, the technology is they use layers of carbon fiber. So like a bracelet, like you see on the top, um, it's consists of about 360 layers of carbon fiber. So which 
you can't imagine a, a piece that thin, that small um, could pack so much uh, fiber in it. And so it gives you a really lightweight piece that, but that is still really strong. And uh, we've been also uh, prototyping now, trying to think about like with each technology, what we can do to uh, maximize the technology. So in this technology, they can really print very, very fast and uh, and obviously take things that are really thin, but make it strong. So we're working on um, recently a kind of um, chain mail uh, bracelet that we're working on with them. So these, um, these collaboration has been um, ongoing. Um, and we also started working with uh, another three printing company called 3DO. Um, I think their technology is also something that is takes the kind of normal binder jetting technology to the next level where there is sort of uh, a kind of cutting uh, step uh, along with each step of the, um, the, the laying of the powder and sintering. And so the precision of this uh, machine is so great that we're able to make um, these uh, ball joint um, and uh, this track along. So you can see that the, in the next video. So each of the each of the uh, chain would connect this way. And so we actually only had to produce uh, basically two uh, modules, uh, a kind of half module and also the whole module of the, the actual um, chain link. So yeah, so, um, so that's been also uh, fun to be able to work at such precision and, you know, in the kind of nascency of uh, the earlier kind of metal printing, you always had to allow for a certain amount of, um, you know, sort of difference in, in the, the final sizing, but with this um, is super, super precise. So well, that's what's pretty cool about it. Um, I think I'm, sorry. And then I'm gonna close at, um, as of yesterday, we opened our um, new shop, uh, our first uh, brick and mortar um, in Taipei. And so um, that's a whole new kind of learning curve that uh, we're embarking, but it's pretty exciting. So, and we're, you know, trying to combine a little architecture in the design of our store as well. So it's been quite a fun process. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jenny, and uh, congratulations on the on the store. That's <laughs> that's it's really wonderful that you're sharing it with with the digital futures community. Um, okay, so on to Jessica. If uh, if you we can we can start uh, sharing your screen while I just lay out some your background. So Jessica Rosenkurt is an artist, uh, designer, and programmer. Uh, she graduated from MIT with degree in biology and architecture in twenty in two thousand and five, uh, and studied architecture at Harvard's Graduate School of Design from twenty uh, from two thousand five to two thousand eight before leaving to found Nervous System. So most of you who are there on Instagram, you you will be seeing a lot of interesting work. Uh, on on her page as well. She was a lecturer at MIT from 2016 to 2019, uh, teaching design students. So Jessica, all yours and it's here. All right, hi, uh, I'm Jessica, as you just heard, and I'm one half of Nervous System. Nervous System is a really kind of strange mashup of design studio, research lab, artist duo, software consultancy, and lifestyle brand. We work in many different materials and make a myriad of different products. We make jewelry, clothing, furniture, lamps, jigsaw puzzles, and um, sometimes things at the scale of architecture. 
What really unites everything we create is that it's generated by software that we write. Our work spans the scale of microscopic 3D printed organs up to large scale public art artwork. Um, our approach to design is really inspired by the complex forms that we see in nature. We're interested in how these patterns emerge from underlying processes, including biological, physical, chemical, and geological systems, particularly fascinated in how similar patterns are seen across very diverse phenomena. A lot of our work explores how computation can change how we approach design. This is a smattering of apps that we have made over the years, some of which were in fact never released and others were made for other companies. Um, my software design philosophy is sort of that it should be more like playing a video game than using an engineering software than using CAD. So rather than worrying about how to construct specific pieces of geometry, um, we want for customers to be able to focus on higher level design elements like density, flow, shape, and fit. Um, so we create applications that are fun to use where you can make very complex objects that would be extremely challenging to model in a traditional CAD software. And we intend for this to be sort of a fun process that doesn't really require much um, design or CAD experience. Um, so this one is a customization tool we created for New Balance for making 3D printed midsoles um, where everything just happens in real time in the browser. Uh, is this going to play? Yes. Okay. So Cell Cycle um, was a pretty old project of ours. I think it was the first 3D design software that we ever created. And as far as I know, it's also the first online system for customizing 3D printed products. Um, it's a web application written in JavaScript um, where you can customize your own cellular rings, bracelets, or art using a physics simulation in real time. The items were then 3D printed in a variety of materials from um, plastic, stainless steel, um, and most of these ones on the screen are sterling silver that are cast from 3D printed waxes. Over the years, we've continued to use jewelry as a medium for really exploring computational processes, new ideas about customization, and also new materials. And I really love sort of the accessibility and immediacy of working at a small scale in jewelry. I'm gonna quickly go through a couple of examples that show how we're using generative systems with 3D printing to create new opportunities in design. Kinematics is a project about making custom fit clothing using 3D printing. Really started from thinking about how you could use 3D printers to make textiles. Textiles are a human construction where you sort of have take a raw material like cotton or wool and you transform it to have a very different behavior by how it's arranged in space. If you sort of think about how a knit fabric versus a woven fabric works, it's all that arrangement that's giving it those stretchy or um, non-stretchy behaviors. So 3D printing has really opened up new possibilities for how you could use computation then to construct materials. You can make really complex configurations um, whose properties could vary through space to create new types of textiles. Kinematics explores a hinge-based 3D printed textile. 3D printers often, most often, make rigid materials, but by structuring our design as interlocking triangles, we can create things that behave more like a fabric. We wanted to create a textile whose material properties could vary through space in rigidity, porosity, drape, and shape. I started out just making small things, jewelry, which is what I normally do, um, but the things I made had a really interesting hybrid behavior of being sort of halfway between hard and halfway between soft. And I immediately thought about making a dress out of this material, um, but a dress was too big to fit into our 3D printer. So what we did was we created a tool that allows us to simulate and computationally fold these structures. By folding it, we can create a compressed form that can be printed as a single piece. So this means we can create a custom fit piece of clothing that could emerge from a 3D printer ready to wear. Nothing ever has to be cut, sewn, or assembled. Um, so if you can make a garment in 3D, why not also design it in 3D? So we created this uh, JavaScript-based design tool called Kinematics Cloth, where you can create garments from body scans and measurements. You can customize the fit, silhouette, and pattern with a pretty intuitive interface. Um, the resulting dresses are these sort of intricately patterned structures made of thousands of interconnected panels, which are all 3D printed as a single piece in nylon. 
Over the years, we've continued to explore this system and build upon it. This is a, a later iteration where the underlying structure is sheathed in a layer of um, 3D printed petals or scales. And there are many sort of different stylistic variations that are possible in the system. I view this project as sort of an example of how we first see generative systems opening up, uh, sort of enabling the creativity of the consumer and opening up design and manufacturing to more people. Um, another project is Floriform, which is a generative design system inspired by biomechanics of growing leaves and blooming flowers, which explores the development of surfaces through differential growth. Differential growth sounds sort of highfalutin, but it's a really like simple idea. Some areas in a biological system are growing faster than other areas, and that leads to the shapes that we see in body plants. Um, one example is plant tropisms. Very well studied plant movements in response to environmental gradients like light or temperature. Plants can grow towards the sun by an asymmetrical sort of growth or elongation of cells on one side of an organ in response to a hormone gradient. Um, we read a paper by a professor at Harvard called Mahadevan, uh, whose name is Mahadevan, and he sort of had a really interesting hypothesis about how flowers bloom. He hypothesized that their sort of ruffled forms and their opening comes from uh, sort of differential growth that just happens at the edge of a leaf or petal. This is pretty cool because it's actually like so simple, the idea that if you just grow faster at the edge, you can generate all this complex form. We were really fascinated by that. And if you look through nature, you sort of see it everywhere, um, especially in plants, flowers, lettuce, kale, irises, but it's sort of also all over the place. Like there's a mushroom like this, there's anemones, sea slugs, coral, um, the arms of jellyfish all sort of have similar types of shapes that can be generated by this fundamental growth pattern. So bringing this back to fashion, <laughs> we created a simulation of a differentially growing elastic surface and sort of this simulation acts as a digital garden that we can play and experiment in. Within the system, we explore how biological systems can create form by varying these growth rates through space and time. That's encoded by sort of the color red that you see in the video is the concentration of the growth hormone. And these are the individual growth patterns and the animation of different jewelry pieces um, that we created, which were then produced in nylon using selective laser centering and also in um, precious metals using loss wax casting. Uh, and then the last project I wanna to show today is called Hyphae, which um, similarly started from a love of leaves, but in this pro particular project, it was a fascination with the venation structures that we see in leaves. And what's super interesting to me is how they're different across every species of plant and even across every leaf on a single plant, every single leaf will have a unique venation structure. There are many kind of competing theories about how veins form. We read one paper by uh, Adam Runyon, a researcher who um, created a simulation of a process called auxin flux canalization. Basically you have a growth hormone that is flowing through the leaf and it's sort of like a river progressively digging a trench where it flows, it's more likely to flow again. There's this positive feedback mechanism. So we started working with this model, again, created a simulation that allows us to explore and play with it digitally, um, looking at some physically impossible situations, like what happens if you have multiple stems? What happens if you really vary density through space? And then ultimately using it to grow a jewelry collection, which we called Hyphae. Uh, these are like some really janky old renderings from like 2010s, you can tell. Things have improved a lot since then in terms of computer graphics. Um, these again were, did I click? Yes, okay, 3D printed in nylon and also precious metal. Um, then we used it to create a collection of lamps called the hyphae lamps, um, sort of like leaves on a tree. Every single hyphae lamp that we make is unique. So we grow sort of hundreds of different forms. Customers pick the ones they want and then we print them and send it to them. So while leaves are 2D and the initial simulation we used was two-dimensional, we decided to try adapting that to 3D. And these structures were really interesting, but we never really found a practical use for them. Uh, but one day I got an email from an engineer, a bioengineer named Jordan Miller at Rice University who was developing a 3D printing technique for living cells. Um, his goal is to design sort of replacement organs uh, because there's a shortage for organs who need transplants. And in the future, we could potentially print replacement organs from people's own cells. Um, 
However, tissue printing is still in its very early stages. And one of the most fundamental problems is just keeping 3D printed tissues alive. To do that, you need networks of blood vessels, which can provide nutrients and oxygen while removing waste. He looked at these 3D branching structures that we had created and thought they would make really efficient blood vessel networks. He sort of challenged us to collaborate with him on designing a lung-like structure. Lungs are obviously incredibly complicated, um, but part of the reason why is because they actually have three interpenetrating networks of fluids. There's an air network and two blood vessel networks. So with this lab, we worked on designing printable vasculature to support the development of artificial organs. Um, this thing on the screen is a 3D printed alveolus-like structure, and alveolus is the smallest base unit of the lung. And the red that you see is actually human red blood cells, which are circulating inside the structure and becoming oxygenated. Ultimately, the goal for this project for us was to create software which could enable scientists to design these customized multivascular structures for 3D printed organs. So this is that same simulation that I was showing before. Um, that was started out as a jewelry collection where we were growing these sort of leaf vein structures in 3D. There's still obviously a lot of challenges in scaling this up into something that could actually be an organ. Um, but this project I think is really intriguing to me, like I said, because it, it started out as being inspired by nature and then it came back to nature. So we made jewelry and lamps and now it sort of came for a circle to designing living replacement organs. Um, okay, so I think I have used my 12 minutes and I am now done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. We'll, we'll pick up on many, many things in the conversation <laughs> with you. Um, so uh, maybe we, I can just um, ask uh, Natalie to just start sharing and <laughs> I'll just quickly read out your bio for our audience as well. So uh, Na um, Natalie Alema uh, currently works at Adidas uh, as a generative designer where she brings radical ideas to, to the market. She previously completed her PhD, which uh, explored robotic feedback systems between biological materials and computational design. Uh, Natalie runs her design practice BioLab Studio, which explores the fusion of fusion between natural, the natural and the artificial realms. Natalie, the floor is yours and let's begin. Thank you, I'm just gonna share my screen. Oops. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm Natalie Alima. Um, just a bit about me. I'm a, my background is in architecture, so similar to everybody else who I eventually branched off. <laughs> um, so I originally studied architecture in Australia, and then I began working as an architect, um, designing multi-residential facade systems. Um, I then wanted to return back to academia to um, conduct more research um, and get more granular in terms of R&D um, and focus on more like robotic systems and 3D printing. Um, during academia, I was completing my PhD with Roland Snook's lab at RMIT University. And I recently completed my PhD and then moved to LA um, to work for the Yeezy team with Adidas and now um, just with Adidas as a generative designer. So today I'm just going to showcase a bit of my own research that I've conducted in my PhD. Um, I also have my art practice via Lab Studio, and I'm just going to show some avenues that I try to implement that kind of innovative research in the commercial industry. Um, I might just minimize this. So um, my design approach is definitely this fusion between um, this like blurred boundary between the natural and the artificial realms. I really like to create this kind of these kind of forms that the viewer can look at and, and think: is this biologically grown or is this um artificially fabricated? Um, so these are just some skeletal three D printed structures made of wood. Um, there's a design catalog um of forms that I've been currently designing that almost act as shields for the human female form. Um, 
So I'm obviously a shoe designer as well as I work for Adidas. Um, so here I'm just going to showcase some quick shoe designs that I've been currently working on. Um, so here are these more kind of futuristic designs where I've been working on these tread patterns that bleed into the upper and create these kind of ballerina flats, um, aerodynamic shoe structures. These are obviously conceptual shoes, but as I mentioned before, my design aesthetic is definitely incorporating natural materials and natural elements within the um, fashion products and specifically within the footwear industry. Um, so here, these conceptual shoes incorporate things like rock formation and water and creating these kind of like ice structures that contribute to the overall shoe design and could create tension for um, shoe treads. Um, so here again, working with natural elements such as ice and water to create this kind of secondary skin for footwear products. So here you can see like the ice training her secondary skin to, to perform um, tension for the shoe. Um, some, some more conceptual shoe designs here. I've been working with a number of tread designs. Um, so here's just a conceptual sandal of these heterogeneous skins that morph from porous systems to quite... Um, these like dense spike systems to create um so obviously porous for the airflow and then these like dense systems for traction for the tread for the shoe. Um and here are just some sandal skins I've been working on with Adidas as well. Um so this is a bit of the stuff that I was doing with um when I was in the Yeezy team. Um here I've just been working on again more conceptual ideas of incorporating um natural elements such as um like um, snow and wood, uh, sorry, snow and water and fog and how to incorporate those natural elements within the shoe. Um, I'm just going to flip through these quickly. So obviously these are taken from um, that Yeezy 350 tread, whoever's a shoe buff within the audience. Um, I'm just going to flip through these quickly. Um, so again, this idea of how to incorporate natural elements in the shoe, uh, this is the more conceptual idea over here and then this is the more refined idea of how to take those kind of elements and add them to the marketing story as well. Um, so here is the idea of creating these like ice structures and how they contribute to the shoe and how the shoe can actually orchestrate biological growth. So you can see here the shoe kind of promoting this natural chemical reaction of the ice structures to form. Um, so here, um, more conceptually so my work is very um this blurred boundary between creating sculptural pieces more conceptual pieces as you can see here and then how to kind of take those key elements and then put them provide them to the commercial industry so thinking about what's the more conceptual piece and how can we actually start to implement those within the commercial industry so how can these elements um be worn every day how can we take these elements and produce them within the commercial industry so that they're durable, um, we can mass produce them, um, we can make them cost effective and really apply those like problem solving um, skills to the more art artistic practice. Um, so here are these um, mushroom grown shoes. Um, and this is done with my practice by lab studio. Um, this is the idea of creating customized patterns of growth to form um, footwear for the for human use um so here this is a more conceptual idea of having these like eye structures um providing secondary skin for footwear um so something i've been working on with my own practice at biolab studio i'm just going to flip through these quickly as well so here the um scaffold underneath is just a three printed skin and the salt rock formation and the mycelium combination of the two elements provide that kind of wispy like aesthetic that kind of secondary skin um within my design practice i also love creating these kind of three printed armor especially for the female form um that are more conceptual ideas so here i've just been designing a breastplate design um and how can that kind of secondary skin morph into like fashionable um hats or um tops for women, both women and men. Um, here I'm just going to flip through to my um, PhD research, which focused on um, robotic feedback systems between biological growth and robotic fabrication. 
So here, what you see here is the robot is actually injecting a liquefied culture of mycelium into these three D printed wooden sacrificial formworks. So through a series of small scale experiments, I discovered that mycelium is actually able to eat through um, wooden fibers. So when you obviously walking through a forest, you'll often see mycelium and mushrooms growing on rotten, rotten wooden logs. And that's because mycelium is attracted to its fibrous properties contained within wood based um, filaments. So here I decided to um, kind of adopt that chemical reaction occurring within nature and think, okay, how can we kind of encourage that chemical reaction to occur within the lab. So here I began 3D printing with wood-based filaments and injecting the mycelium culture to, um, you know, to kind of study how the mycelium would react to artificial woods and kind of these customized forms. Um, so this stream of research was called um, bioscaffolds. And here I've created a series of mini scaffolds intended to orchestrate biological growth. Um, so here, these wooden scaffolds are intended to um, orchestrate mycelium growth through its lattice systems and porous structures. And here are just some um, close-ups of those forms here. So as you can see, each form kind of invokes a different algorithm, which produces a variety of lattice systems or these like digital antennas that are arrayed across the surface or these quite porous skins. Um, so this is the before and after, basically. So this is um, the barren um, scaffolds, the 3D printed scaffolds. And this is an image of the mycelium growing through the entire structure. As you can see here, the mushroom starting to fruit along the form. Um, and what's really interesting about this process is that I became quite fascinated of, of this idea of how to orchestrate biological growth through robotic fabrication and computational design. So how can we kind of digitally design forms that promote biological growth in certain areas? And how can the material also promote um, the mushrooms growing in certain areas as well? Um, and this is more of a conceptual idea of 3D printing those kind of miniature bioscaffolds at a larger scale. So what would these look like at a more architectural scale within like museums and things like that? And this, these forms are obviously taking reference from the mini bioscaffolds I showcased before. Um, and here is actually an image of once the mycelium eats through the entire structure, it turns into this fly, uh, white flush exterior. So this is this is um, an image when the mycelium completely biodegrades and eats through the entire structure, which I thought was really interesting because you'll never really see these kind of mycelium formations with nature, only when the human kind of hacks into that chemical reaction. Um, and here are just some computational renders of those um fabricated scaffolds that I showcased before, just showcasing um, computational processes. Um, and here is an image of something I completed with my team um, at RMIT University with um, Hassam and Roland Snooks is thinking about how to 3D print large scale wall panel installations and use my slim as a natural acoustic for the um, infill of the wall. I think I'm a bit over time, so I might just slip through this. Um, and here's just a close-up of the mycelium within the wall panel system. Um, and here's just an image of just experimenting with various types of biofabrication, so utilising um, kombucha and slime mould to create different materials for the commercial industry. Um, and here, just testing different modes of fabrication, um, so testing things like how can we 3D print within um, gel systems. So this research is um, mostly occurring with MIT, but just kind of adopting the same techniques to kind of test different geometries. And I'll just finish on this project of um, 3D printing with this fusion of mycelium clay. So before I just showcased um, 3D printing these scaffolds and then later applying the mycelium, but here I began to test, okay, how can we actually print with the mycelium itself and eliminate the need for a structural host system? So here I became really interested in 3D printing these living structures that grew and adapted post its 3D print. And I'll just finish on this slide here. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Um, I think... Uh,
I think if if I may just request all the speakers to just uh, turn on the videos. Yeah. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Jessica. I think let's uh, we we can move on to the to the panel discussion. I do have some questions that uh, uh, that come up from from your work as well and uh, but i would also encourage anyone on uh, zoom who, uh, and as well as on youtube if you would like to ask the questions to the speakers just put it up on the chat so maybe i can um, we also have behnaz joining in uh, okay uh, hi behnaz um Hi, hi, sorry, I had a very bad um, internet, so I managed to finally connect. Ah, okay, okay, that's, re <laughs> that's really, um, uh, so uh, Behnaz, uh, we we just got done with uh, Natalie's pre presentation, uh, should we just go ahead maybe then do your presentation and move to the sure. panel discussion? Sure, just How give me a want? second, let me see if I can connect my, okay. uh, I'm, share my screen. I'm, yeah, okay. And I'm sorry to the other speakers, but let's go with Behnaz's presentation and then we'll move to the panel discussion. Okay. Okay, I will go very short, um, hopefully. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, so I am going to uh, share my screen. Let me know when you see it. Yeah. Um, so, um, sorry, do you see my screen? Um, yeah, we've stopped. Yeah, we see your screen. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, it's wonderful to be here um, and um, be among amazing colleagues that I admire your work uh, for so long. So um, I want to first start by saying that um, uh, in 2015, uh, we with Neil Leach, we co-edited an issue of Architectural Design Magazine called 3D Printed Body Architecture. Just because we have realized that um, there are generations of architects that um, they are actually producing not conventional, um, what perceive as traditional architecture in terms of building construction, but that they actually applying their skills and their knowledge to a different type of architecture. We notice this as a sort of body of work that is emerging from all around the world through the groundbreaking works of individuals such as Mary Oxman, Nervous System, Jenny Wu, um, Ron Riel, um, and many others that they're exploring, Nicola Cassas, and many of others that their work wasn't necessarily architecture with capital A, but they apply the skills and knowledge of architecture to body scale, um, uh, body scale size of architecture. I also have to say that uh, I'm very, very excited that our new book, um, Interactive Design, just came out. Um, and now you can hopefully find it um, in Europe. Um, soon you can find it in US too. Uh, but it's very extremely exciting to, 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 to have this book come out. With that, um, I want to start saying, uh, introducing myself a little more. Uh, I'm a designer that I work at the intersection of interactive design, fashion and architecture. Um, and for me, um, the changing of the scale is very important. In other words, um, changing from the scale of the intimate scale of variables and fashion all the way to architectural scale is absolutely something that I'm excited. And um, in all of this, I'm really interested in tactility, texture and movement of materials and see how we can use computational system into the substrate of materials, where materials become um, machines and machines become materials. And in this case, machines that they can in engage with our emotion. So when I started doing this type of work, a lot of my work was first in scale of architecture uh, creating materials that they're shape changing, that they're color changing, they're texture changing, exploring how installation um, in a scale of architecture could be alive, could be augmented with artificial intelligence, 
in order to foster a new type of intuitive relationship between human body and the users. Um, either some of these installations, they respond to the hand movements, to, to a speech uh, or a spoken words of the users, to tracking um, skeletons and movements of the people in the space. This was something that it was absolutely um, crucial in, in this design research. But these ideas didn't stay in the form of in the architecture. For me, I start, this all started from doing an artist in residency in Autodesk in San Francisco, where I had access to multi-material 3D printing. And I soon was fascinated to see how can I use 3D printing in the scale of hu human body. Um, I had access to these tools, which was allowing me to produce outcomes um, myself uh, in the workshop uh, for the human body. So I started doing exploring how we can explore these technologies around the human body in order to influence human perceptions, social interactions, or um, our extending our intelligence. So this helmet is a neuromorphic helmet, 3D printed using multi-material 3D printing, which moves according to the brain activity of the wearer. So as the wearer attention level goes higher, the helmet opens up. And as the, uh, and the, as the attention level goes down, the helmet closes down and creates a cocoon, uh, a cocoon around the head. I would say nature is the main inspiration in my work. Um, it's inspiring not only in terms of its intelligence in responding to both, um, because I mean, obviously it's beautiful, but also it's intelligence in responding to both internal and external stimuli. So I'm really interested to see how our fashion, our wearable can also be alive, could also address um, uh, information about uh, its surrounding environment, either either social, political, or cultural. Cultural. Uh, very quickly, I want to say that there are four concerns that concern my design practice. That includes exploring new materials, interactive system, robotics, and what I call critical design. In terms of um, new materials, a uh, part of my design research is really looking at developing new materials using 3D printing, robotic fabrication, and algorithmic design tools. A lot of time inspired by um, natural systems such as feathers, hair, and fish scale systems, which varies their properties across the surface from hard to soft, from very dense to very porous. I'm really interested to develop materials that they can change their properties across the surface. So these materials can be soft and flexible when it needs to be, they could be active instead of passive. So I'm really interested to explore a variety of actuation systems, such as soft robotics and um, uh, a smart material along this um, journey in uh, 3D printing as well. And along with that, I also look at a variety of sensory technologies that allow us to track various sensory information from the user either EEG brain, brain, uh, brain sensors, um, capturing brain activities to various facial tracking, uh, gaze tracking uh, and facial expression tracking systems, which allow us to understand physiological responses from the users as part of my um, design practice. Without going so much in details, I have to say that the notion of affective computing and emotion has been interesting to me for a long time. It's been really interested to also explore it, not to just human, but other species like cats, dogs, and, and mice. Uh, and they bristle their fur when they're intimidated. So I've been really interested in ways where our wearable could act as second skin, and it can respond to uh, a surrounding environment. going to talk over this uh, this one. Um, so for instance, um, this um, soft robotic um, dress that responds to uh, facial expressions of the people around with different type of soft robotic behavior. So the dress is made of uh, fiber optics and, and soft robotic components, which uh, basically respond with various type of behavior uh, according to information that is captured from its surrounding environment. So I'm going to pass this, this work is in my website. 
but I'm going to focus more on next two projects, which is um, Iridescence, um, which is a 3D printed color um, that it was um, designed and built for, um, commissioned for Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. Um, this was initially inspired by hummingbirds. Hummingbirds are amazing creature that um, change the color of their feathers with the twist of their um, with the twist of their head from dark green to to magenta. So um, we were very interested to explore how we can produce um, an outfit that um, basically changes both color and shape. Uh, so we decided to produce this electromechanical, very small electromechanical components in house. Um, and this decision was easy in the first place, but it went through a lot of uh, back and forth iteration. Uh, and the process of making was extremely back and forth uh, in this stage. It took us six months to really fine tune these um, mechanisms. We wanted to make, build these uh, mechanisms in house because we wanted to make sure that the museum staff can easily change um, each components. So, um, and I also want to say that conceptually, this piece. Um, so there is a camera embedded inside um, the the base of this piece is three D printed. Um, it's equipped with two hundred moving quills, which is electromagnetic. There is a camera embedded inside the piece that sees the other people uh, around. It understands where people are standing and what emotions they're expressing through their facial expressions. And um, through various type of behaviors, such as fast movements or creating ripple effects, it basically responds um, accordingly. Now, if you're the wearer and if your eyes are closed or if you're blind, through the movements or, or hearing the movements of your uh, wearable, you can understand where people are standing and what kind of facial expression they're expressing. And so it's potentially augments uh, sort of sensory inputs uh, to, the, to the users. Um, I know that I'm running short, so I'm going to very quickly uh, go through some of the slides because I don't have time. I want to show that some of the work that also I have produced with my students, including these 3D printed um, workshops, um, that uh, some of the results that you can see that I was very proud. Um, and maybe I finish with um, one uh, project that I think it's got a lot of uh, sort of media attention um, from non-architect or non-designer, but in a way it just resonates with a lot of people. And that is Chris of the Gaze. Um, I've been really, uh, for the last few years, I've been really interested in the notion of the gaze and surveillance and ways that we can use our gaze as a resistance strategy. Um, and in particular, how we could use surveillance technology to allow women to know when their body is being looked at. So this piece is multi-material 3D printed um, cape that is equipped with facial tracking camera. The facial tracking camera can track um, uh, gender, gaze, and the age of the onlookers. And according to where the onlooker is looking, um, the garment uh, or the wearable basically moves. I know that uh, we're running uh, short, so I, I, we're running late, so I'm going to talk over this video. I want to say that while this video is running in the background, um, so if you're the wearer, you know that which part of your body basically is looked at. And if you're onlooker, you know that your action is being um, notified. So this potentially changes the social interaction. Uh, maybe while uh, this is running in the background, I want to say a few things uh, that uh, for me is very important in terms of working in the scale of fashion um, and computation. And that is, for me, these are very, uh, like using 3D printing and computational design, it can open up so many possibilities for the world of design. But I'm also interested to not just use these technologies for the sake of technologies um, or for producing beautiful objects, but also to address larger cultural, social, and political issues.
So with that, I'm going to stop here and share my screen. And I'm looking forward to conversation with all of you. Thank you, Benaz. Um, I think you left at a very interesting note for the for the discussion to uh, begin. Um, maybe I can just quickly invite. I know Jenny, uh, you are uh, located in a different time zone, so maybe I could just uh, pitch in few questions for uh, for you all. Um, um, so it's quite interesting to just uh, look at. Um, the work and and more than the work i think it's it's each one of your process to navigate these different technologies that have been given and over a period of a good decade or so if i if i may take that liberty to <laughs> to say that but uh, for you jenny i i kind of want to understand that uh, you are navigating this whole idea of uh, having a more comfortable wearable piece which someone is going to going to maybe have it or cherish it for a very long time. And you're also dealing with something which is related to the precision and resolution of the machine that is needed because of the of the fashion variables that you're creating. So I want to understand that how do you navigate the limitations of the of the 3D printing machines into, into your uh, work? And <clears throat> is there any at any point to does your creative process also uh, kind of gets affected because of certain uh, machine limitations? Maybe now there is better, but maybe you can speak from your experience with, with different uh, collaborations that you have done as well. I mean, I think that's the, the kind of heart of um, creating a kind of commercial brand is that you're you know, faced with the limitations of your production method and, you know, the costs and, and, and all of that. And I think that, um, I guess I, you know, I think this is why I was sort of mentioning that it, it feels like, um, you know, the last 10 years, it really has evolved all the, all of the technologies. And it's like the little things that you didn't realize, like when, when 3d printing first came out, I'm sure Jessica was doing this where we like hand dyed pieces and things like that. And then now they're just like really fancy machines that would do it without, you know, the pieces fade and, uh, you know, turn weird colors afterwards. And so I feel like there's a lot of things that, you know, uh, in the early days, you would have like, kind of had to figure out how to work around it. And um, over time, especially the last three years, like they're just, there's literally a technology to fix every problem, whether it's accessible in terms of its price, that's a different thing. But you know, it's definitely um, so the workaround gets uh, less, maybe, but at the same time, it, every technology comes with a cost. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder if uh, uh, Natalie, do uh, what do you kind of feel through your work about the same question? Because I see that while you're working with biomaterials, you also and robotic fabrication. Maybe in your PhD thesis, you did have some uh, some ways in which you would make some end effectors for the robot to be able to work with mycelium and mycelium by itself will also come with its own agency and uh, to work around so so how do you navigate through your creative process and where do you stop as well in your work so to let the let that biomaterial grow on its on on its own so yeah that's a really great question um I often meet myself personally when working with nature, I'm more interested in its agency of growth and less as a material. So within my research, I always love to keep nature growing and observe what it did and have the robot react to that rather than um, using my slime as like a building material or, um, you know, drying it up and using it as a, a, a brick or something. Um so I was always really interested in having this feedback system between how the robot can detect where the mycelium was growing and react accordingly. Um, and even within with my research, I found that um, the tools available to detect biological growth um, were quite difficult. 
Um, you know, we obviously have vision systems that can detect um, um, la larger scales of data, such as like um, cloud points from a room, but it's very difficult to computationally detect micro basical patterns of growth unless you have one of those um, med medical grade cameras. Um, so for me in my research, there was a lot of hacking into <laughs> existing machines and existing tools to kind of DIY it working with biology um and so from an architect's point of view um i was hacking into a lot of machines to creating customized tools to react to the mycelium i was creating customized like vision sets there's a lot of hacking a lot of like diy kind of style um and i kind of wish i kind of had access to these higher grade more expensive tools um but i i really personally think that um you know, as as Jessica mentioned in her presentation, when you're bound by the limitations of robotics, so she mentioned that she was bound by the limitations of the printing bed. Oh it's interesting to find innovative solutions to work around that. I think you really can with um, 3D printing, robotics, and computational design and vision systems. Yeah, yeah. No, that's 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 really what I wanted to even provoke a little bit and ask Jessica about. Uh, about that work because I see that Jessica, you also figured out uh, your own tool of the software interfaces to allow you and the user and anyone you're producing that tool for to be to be more creative with with it while you're also looking into into three D printing those those products. So I also want to kind of uh, ask you a few questions around this access to technology and creating your own uh, tools to, to really bring that component of biology into fashion or objects and that scale as well. There is, a, there is an underlying question of how far do you go with the resolution because you know that it's going to be 3D printed. So is there any limitation in that sense with your software designs or do you really account for that the, that the products are going to be 3D printed? Yeah, you're on mute. Muted. I would say that uh, each one of our sort of cost computational systems that we make consumer facing or put on the internet is highly specific for the fabrication process. So mm -hmm. there's just so many limitations to the printers or however it's being made um, that the design has to be pretty strongly constrained around those limitations. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also pretty important just to like kind of set people up for success because design can be a little bit overwhelming if you go into it with infinite possibilities. So creating a system that has sort of inherent sort of logic and limitations to it such that people can explore and have a lot of sort of easy ins to good outcomes um, is important to sort of having that system have people be willing to engage with it. Um, people are a little scared to engage with a system where it just produces things that or unmakeable or undesirable. So yeah, a lot of thought does go into that um, with the systems that we open up to other people. Unfortunately, the systems we make for ourselves produce sort of infinite unmakeable and undesirable results, but we sort of have the fortitude to deal with that rather than you know our consumers or people visiting the website. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I think Behnaz, this, this conversation is leading me and at least helping me to just ask you a few questions on on the on the statement that you just made in the beginning of your presentation that we are no more a big a for architecture and we are doing many more things and i think this panel over here and many many of the discussions we've had in the last four weeks are around the uh, around the idea of actually really uh, introspecting on the tools uh, uh, that we have today and that's not just what we have been we've been given by the industry or what we borrowed from the industry, but also making your own creative tools. And I see that in your work as well, a lot that you, you do make and introspect on, on each and every interactive piece that you, you are doing. So I want to understand also in your work and process, where does that idea of making by hand lie in your work? Maybe this is out of the panel because, but, but we have you here and I want to just ask you these questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the question is where the idea of making by hand intersects yeah, with, with my work or with 
in general with uh, computational design. With 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 your work within your work I, within your broader field of <laughs> yeah yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, t I, I, I see myself as a critical maker because I, I really value sort of uh, hands-on making and combine that with some sort of critical thinking. So for me, a lot of the process is actually iterative process of making things. And when I say it doesn't necessarily mean with hands, and I'm, that's why I'm really interested in the notion of digital craft, where there are certain elements of uh, the process that it uses digital design and digital fabrication techniques. But at the same time, um, there is the question of craft, how things would look like and how, what kind of um, sort of uh, aesthetic expressions as well as behaviors you can achieve through those material exploration. So um, for me is a lot of, time especially on in in, in um uh working with uh 3d printing not necessarily 3d printing plastic but 3d printing using robotic uh, dispensing process or clay 3d printing or any type of 3d printing is really also exploring where is the limit of where you can push the material to do something unconventional uh, or how can you use exploration of how how can you use potential of the machine to produce something that um, uh, allow the, the 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 material to behave in a certain way? And let me, like for instance, I want to just give you this example because I think that was very interesting um, process. I, I collaborated with a Dutch uh, fashion designer Pauline van Dongen, uh, and when she came to LA, we were basically the house in. Um, uh, 3D system, working for a month very intensely with all the machines and together. Um, and what was really fascinating was like we had access to this machine that the material was extremely brittle uh, and it was very fragile. But we realized that when you start printing these objects in the form of a spiral, they're extremely resilient and flexible. So the whole form and aesthetic expression was all around the, the spiral and coil. And the whole dress uh, basically become a series of intertwined coiled spirals. So I love these type of processes where a very sort of first tiny small experiment, like printing one little small spiral, all of a sudden informed the entire process. And then it's become the aesthetic expressions, it's become the uh, expression of the entire piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's quite uh, quite interesting. Um, uh, maybe maybe another question that I have for for uh, Behnaz, you and uh, Jenny, I know that you're actively engaged with the teaching as well, and you you all have a very different journey even with with your practice as well. So uh, I want to I want to urge you if you could throw some light um, that how does the integration of teaching and design practices have mutually kind of benefited or mutually influenced your uh, uh, your work with your students as well as in your in your practice so how do you see the 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 role that the teaching and your working with the students and naivety that they bring in um, uh, influence your work Jenny would you like to go first I was thinking you can keep keep going <laughs> Sure, I can go. Um, so um, for me, um, I love um, teaching uh, where it's possible to explore some of these ideas with the students. I love being in an academic environment, in fact, because of this reason, because it allows for experimentation. It allows for exploring ideas that not necessarily need to um, make a perfect sense, meaning commercially needs to make a perfect sense, but you still can explore ideas about future, the future of design, future of fabrication, future of um, of construction. So with my students, um, we do variety. I, I, I am co-coordinator of the program, graduate program, Human Experience Design Interaction, where we explore variety of ways that we can produce materials or produce designs using robotic fabrication, uh, 3D printing, clay printing, bioplastic, chitosan-based 3D printing. 
um, to, to various sort of interactive um, systems, use of artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning algorithms. So it really, for me, what is very exciting, again, is a, a way to explore many of the ideas in collaboration with the students um, so um, it's become almost a lot of times things that I am interested in and then or things that are also I think uh, has a lot of potential for growth to further explore with 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 the students. Um, the reality is we don't have time for doing all of this research. And then we are thinking about, for instance, like Kaitazen based 3D printing was something that I really wanted to do for a long time. I had a master thesis student um, that who was her thesis was all about sort of developing that. So for me, it was also like, how can we create a platform to capture her research? So her research become a sort of platform for the next students who wants to do this type of research. These are the area of the research that they have certainly large overlap with my own personal uh, interest but maybe I don't have time to explore that on my own. So I feel like teaching very uh, much um, benefits my draw design practice in this case, because for me, it's like extension of my own design practice to, to explore some of the ideas with and along with the students. I mean, I think my, my answer, I'm going to, there's just a lot of overlap with Banaz, so I won't repeat those, but, yeah, you know, yeah. obviously we're, you know, extending the, our own research with our students. And I think the, to me, just fundamentally, you know, I've been teaching for a long time, but, um, you know, it's just, it's a way of just keeping yourself sharp also. And like, you know, they challenge you and they kind of make sure you don't get too comfortable when you're starting to do things that are like the same. They're like, come on, you know? So I think that, that that to me is a, is a all, always a helpful kind of push uh, in the right direction. That's, that's absolutely true. Uh, we do have Jessica some... was also um, was teaching uh, for some time with, with Skylar. You were teaching Jessica, right? Yeah. 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 How was that for you? Actually, I'm curious to hear now. Yeah, I mean, I think it was really fun, sort of mostly for the reason that Jenny was just saying, is it really like challenges you and keeps you sharp. Um, but I sort of decided to go to teach at MIT because I had I went to MIT. And when I was there, I was very unhappy <laughs> with the program. And I felt like I couldn't really like connect with any of my instructors and they weren't really giving me the space to explore what I wanted to explore. So I was sort of like trying to go back for sort of like bringing it full circle, like going and trying to like be the instructor that I wanted to have when I was an undergrad. And I felt like I didn't get that. And it was, it was really fun. I enjoyed it. But then I ended up moving to the middle of nowhere in the Catskill Mountains. So it was no longer convenient to, to be teaching in Boston. But I'm actually going back in January to teach a workshop for a week for MIT undergrads during IEP. So that should be, should be fun to go back and teach again, even if it's only for a week. Sort of nice to be able to escape, actually. <laughs> so there are some questions uh, in the chat. Uh, I'll let you have uh, a look at it. But before that, I also want to kind of just put, put out a question. Uh, Behnaz, uh, uh, the book uh, that uh, the 3D printed body architecture also had works from Jessica and I'm sure like many others, Madeline Gannon and uh, Emerging Objects was there. And uh, it's been, I was just looking before the session, it was 2017 is when the book was released. And I'm I'm assuming you must have started looking and really uh, looking, anticipating what the future of 3D printed body architecture would be. Now we are almost there when you must have started this inquiry. Uh, 10 years or eight years down the line. So what do you um, anticipate for the future? Like, what do you think would be the 3D printed? Both for you, Jessica, Jenny, Nat Natalie, you all are <laughs> part of it. So if if you all want to kind of just uh, give out some some anticipated future for, for 3D printing and fashion. I think um, for me, what's interesting to explore is I know 3D printing um, up to now has been really great for creating customized one-off pieces. 
Um, for me, being the commercial industry, I'm really interested in a future where we can have 3D printing to market. So can a customer walk into a store, design what they want and have it 3D printed in five minutes and then walk out the store with that pair of shoes? And can that 3D printed material be durable enough to, to handle weather conditions, um, survive over a number of years and not just strictly be a kind of one-off architectural art piece um so that's the kind of where i see and hope the future of 3d printing will go in terms of the commercial industry are we all supposed to answer this um if you would like to if you want to i mean this <laughs> this is a place where we could we could probably and maybe i could come back to it on in five years time and ask you all did you anticipate it <laughs> so yeah but uh, up to you yes of course we like to hear <laughs> yeah i i honestly don't think that much has changed since 2017 in terms of the technologies and materials available there's still um like natalie was saying we're still like not really able to like produce things cheaply or fastly so the impact of 3d printing and actual like consumer goods is fairly small um, still primarily like used for prototyping or, or high-end products, um, hasn't really gotten to like, you know, mass production levels in terms of usage. And I hope to see that change, but, you know, there need to be some like huge leaps in technology that we haven't like seen yet in materials. And so many of the materials that are used are plastics, which we now are learning like so much about their impact on the environment. And that's why it's great to see people engaging with more biomaterials. Um, but that is still seems more in the experimental phase and less in the like for consumer use production phase. So although 3D printing initially was like, oh, my God, there's so much is happening and it's in the news. But it's like actually in terms of like useful technologies that have come apart, come in the past like five years or something or even 10 years. Not that much has changed, is my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Benaz or Jenny, would would you uh, kind of, uh, what do you feel? Jenny, specifically, uh, you, I know uh, that you've been constantly navigating this phase of uh, doing the, uh, doing lace and constantly navigating the changing landscape of technology. And, and it's interesting to also see your collaboration with others in the industry which have the better technology and all. So you have seen the, that side. Uh, of how it's fabricated and produced. Yeah, I mean, I sort of, in some ways, I, I feel like both uh, Natalie and Jessica are, are are both like I feel the same. Like I I wish uh, things are, you know, uh, things are. I mean, I feel the frustration of things are not uh, as cheap or is could go faster or bigger, uh, bigger beds or, you know, things, they're just a, like, we, we keep talking about the kind of workaround, but I also sort of have the, the optimism that, you know, some like it's, it's still, it, it will keep going. And I think there's hopefully enough, like I, I, like my aim always with lace was to, it's not, you know, producing prototypes, but we produce uh, end pieces with 3D printing. And that has so many challenges, like right from the beginning. And I, I think, you know, it still is, but I definitely feel like it's less now than before. But then, you know, I still think there's a lot, a, <laughs> a lot to go. But, you know, for me, it is bo both like kind of the, the fun in some ways, the fun aspect of it, because then I learned about something else and I'm like, oh, what can I do with this? And then, you know, what else can I do with that? So, you know, to me, this is part of all the kind of uh, the fun experimentation that that comes along with this process. So I'm hopeful. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think that's, that's great. So uh, um, I'm going to go to the next question. Uh, I know uh, we we're also kind of uh, pushing Jenny beyond her <laughs> time uh, thing as well. So uh, there is a question I think from YouTube chat to everyone in the panel. How do you uh, navigate through the transition of a prototype in research to a product in the industry, and how does it become a commodity accessible 
uh, to the consumers. So we've kind of touched upon, but if there are any more thoughts on this question. Um, maybe I can touch upon that in terms of um, utilizing biomaterials within the commercial industry. Um, I initially was utilizing biomaterials to grow like quite conceptual um, products. So like thinking about how can we create a shoe completely grown out of fungi and how can we create like shoelaces grown out of um, slime molds and like very conceptual, very artistic, I would say. Um, but then when you're actually thinking about the commercial industry and like if this technology is readily available to be mass produced, um, definitely not. Um, it's also not able to be to it's not durable it's not um it's quite slow to grow it's expensive for the materials so i would say it's definitely not ready for mass production however you can look at it as kind of a inspiration so for example there definitely are biomaterials that are ready for mass production so for example if you're growing a mycelium shoe you can think, okay, what elements can I take to the commercial industry? Can we grow mycelium packaging for the shoe? Can we grow, um, can we have like hemp uppers for shoes? Um, so I wouldn't say like you can take one for one into the commercial industry from the conceptual stage, but there's definitely like elements you can pick out um, from like initial projects and experiments and then think, okay, what technologies do we have readily available to mass produce these ideas? Mm -hmm. Benaz, I I wonder if uh, if you came across this this kind of uh, uh, transition of a prototype research into a final product, especially while working with with many uh, big fashion designers and within the within the final product of 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 your work getting mm -hmm. out there and being worn by someone. Well, I don't know if. Um, I feel like the question was more towards sort of mass production. So that's something that my practice is not necessarily looking into that. So I'm, I have to say that my work is usually one-off projects. Now, those one-off objects are a lot of times um, uh, polished and, and they're, they're produced in a way that they can be on display or on a runway show. Uh, but so it has the qualities of polished, finished product. Having said that, I have to say that I never get engaged with mass production. And, and that was something that I was personally not going mm -hmm. for um, to, to go through the business side of the thing and trying to figure that out. Um, so, so it's a very uh, different answer in a way, but definitely the process of how do you fine tune one object, one design, um, and fine tune that to have it the sort of polished outlook, to have the craft um, in terms of aesthetic, in terms of material prop properties, is something that um, I'm, I'm definitely very, very interested and in, have been exploring. Um, I want to use this opportunity to say some very few things about last uh, question you asked about. Um, what is, do I see the future? I think there is a lot of hype around any new technology that comes to the market. Right now we see it in artificial intelligence, uh, sort of everyone just uh, talking about it. And it is fair. I mean, it is changing a lot of professions and it, it is changing our education. And back then it was a lot of hype around 3D printing and we have to face it, there was. Um, I still think 3D printing is, um, uh, or has many potential and it opens up so many potential for designers around the world. But I agree with all the uh, speakers that uh, the, the promise that it was uh, basically uh, made, it was never really delivered to, the, to its full potential. We would have thought that everyone have it at home and it's super cheap and every shopping mall have like 3D printed items, right? That none of that really happened. But I see the potential future of 3D printing for um, a lot of uh, material exploration in electronic 3D printing, in biomaterial 3D printing, materials that are very difficult to handle or, um, or, or very difficult to control with hands or any other digital fabrication technologies will be able to produce with 3D printing. I see a lot of potential 
uh, for that. Um, so less of sort of post assembly process, but to see how materials could be developed, electronics as well as material properties developed during the process of 3D printing. Um, sorry, I just it was something that I no, really want. No, I uh, my apologies. I I, I uh, skipped out uh, uh, on it, but yeah, that's a that's a wonderful uh, insight. I. I do kind of uh, believe that there is a lot of more explorations happening uh, in the material uh, aspect. And then it might come back to the robotic 3D printing or any kind of 3D printing. And so we we do kind of see that a lot in the past four weeks. A lot of our panel discussions were constantly around the idea of material. So we, we might have come across uh, that uh, in your work as well. So... Just to kind of, I I want to kind of even wrap up this que uh, this panel discussion with a question just for our audience, which is again, as you know, Digital Futures is more of an educational platform where we <clears throat> these sessions are also a source of inspiration for many students. So I just want to kind of ask a quick uh, round of final comments from you all. That how do you how do you really maintain a sense of curiosity amidst the widespread spread explorations of 3D printing and even the the like Ben has mentioned that there are just so many technologies which are changing fast and we the way we interact with our world the way we see the world now is is just so fast paced and it's becoming so so technology driven so how do you still create remain uh, how do you still kind of do that creative inquiry uh, uh, and the sense of curiosity uh, on how do you how do you navigate that for this is more for the audience so if you could give some feedback um I'll just jump into this one I think what's what, what's interesting about the panel is I think that the, the common connection between us all is that we're all very like multidisciplinary designers like in everyone's presentations I've done like fashion medical all mm -hmm. these like variety of applications and I think for myself and I can assume for the other panel members, I'm just going to speak for everybody, <laughs> is um, I think that like the what's interesting about this new emergence of design is this idea of like a hybrid architect. So architects drawing information, uh, drawing inspiration from the innovative technologies occurring within the biomedical industry and fusing that with like large scale buildings or how can we like hack into like, existing um, processes occurring within fashion and then bring in like um, engineering um, technologies into that? So I think this like m um, fusion of fields is really interesting. And for me personally, where I kind of draw inspiration for that is just kind of um, this idea of researching and being aware of um, inspiration and technologies occurring within the fields of architecture. So what's happening with the fields of, um, I don't know, typeface or what's happening with the fields of fashion or what's happening in the fields of um, medical or science or biology. So I think just keeping a pulse on um, current events and current um, technologies is really um, important to me and just drawing inspirations from external fields outside of architecture. I just love what Natalie said, so I want to I want to jump in because I think it's really relevant to what I want to say as well. I I think uh, I absolutely agree with this sort of interdisciplinary, like in a way, this interdisciplinary approach to design, right? Like what other disciplines? How can you look at these different disciplines? Not as something that there are silos that you you don't have to touch, but how you can actually start experimenting with different knowledge from various silos of education and then bring them together. And I want to say, I wanted to answer this question by saying that I think the what we all, in a way, could benefit from is to let our curiosity to take us through this journey, because we all have many curiosities about so many ideas, so many fields. And when you let your curiosity, and maybe this is to the audience, in a way, when you let the curiosity to drives you, then that comes from your intuition, from passion, from excitements that that is not about, oh, what is the hype right now, but what am I interested to know more? And if you allow for that curiosity to drives you, 
then your journey is going to be fruit, fruitful. It's going to be, um, no matter what is the result, it's going to be taking you somewhere a uh, niche and somewhere it, you're going to, you're going to create your own uh, virtue. Uh, so I think I see a lot of potential for thinking about interdisciplinary thinking that is driven by your curiosity rather than what is exciting right now? What should I do right now? What should I learn right now? But more of like, what am I interested and in? how I can learn that? And, and what are the knowledge that I am interested to know more? Um, and, and I think that's a good way, way to approach it. I also want to say one more thing. I'm sorry. It's just like, because digital future has been like, uh, very interesting to also observe how, um, you guys have, uh, developed from the very first day, uh, especially during the pandemic to right now, what, where we are and the community has grown from all around the world. And it is extremely exciting to see that there is a community uh, thirsty for receiving this knowledge and you guys really have developed a platform which is um, not um, uh, financially uh, making money. Uh, it's really about accessing the knowledge and education and, and yet it developed a really wonderful um, sort of community around that. So I think uh for the audience to find out more of what what other organization what other institution allows this type type of access to knowledge that i can learn more that i can take workshops that i can listen to speakers i think i think um that would be sort of another um way to 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 expand the knowledge so thank you mm -hmm. Thank you, Vena. That was wonderful. Uh, Jenny, I wonder, Jenny and Jessica, if you have any final comments and yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I totally agree um, with um, what Benaz and Natalie are um, speaking about, but I also think sometimes um, like students, uh, uh, you know, you end up dabbling into a lot of things. And I think what's, I think what's evident in, um, I, I hope that, I mean, seeing all the, the work from the panelists is that there is such depth in the kind of research and, and really going deep into whatever it is that you're passionate about. And I think that's, to me, is fundamentally what keeps you interested and curious and I think if you're just like sort of trying out and giving up at every step, and even if it's sort of across the spectrum of what multidisciplinary might be, I think uh, sometimes at some point you're going to have to like, just like got to figure it out. How do I get, you know, how do I actually do the work around? How do I make this work for what it is that you need to do? So, um, so yeah, that's kind of my, my two cents. Yeah, I think everything that everybody said is totally right. I was trying to think yeah. like, what did I take away from studying architecture that like I actually use today because I don't work in architecture. And I think a lot of it's just the design process. It's like actually really similar to the scientific method in terms of like coming up with like a basic idea and then exploring it, researching it and iterating through it. And like Jenny was saying, going really deep and that's sort of where you grow your curiosity of sort of like exploring a place no one has been before a world of your own creation and just going like deeper and deeper on that and building it up. And of course, I'm also really excited about all these interdisciplinary yeah. um, experiments. And we work with scientists and biologists, mathematicians, and that's super interesting, but then bringing our design process to that and using that as a way to explore and iterate through possibilities is what sort of mm -hmm. where I find my creative juices, I guess. But it's been really great to see everybody. And nice. uh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, I I I, I think uh, uh, these questions were were also laid out just as a set of inquiries into the future. And the the whole idea for this series is while we also want to look at all the amazing work that you all are doing and contributing, we also wanted to just have a have a chat. So thank you so much for giving giving us so much time. Um, and uh, we look forward to you meeting you all again, maybe online, in person. We don't know how we kind of move forward. But this is also the last session for, for the year 2023. We will continue 
into 3D printing series next year with many more speakers as well as many other similar series looking forward into the future. And um, we hope you find the find all the links to, to the series online. And this is for the YouTube audience. If you, uh, you can follow us on Instagram, all the links are posted there. The session today and even from the past series are all available on Digital Futures YouTube channel. And have a great uh, weekend. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Venas, Jenny, Jessica. Thank you all. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.